I want to read to you some poetry. Inshallah, I will read some verses from the Holy Quran. Some sayings of the Prophet as well. Maybe not all of them in this sitting. Nevertheless, I'd like to start with a, a poem from this very rare book that is called The Four Journeys by Sheikh Fadlallah. It is not commonly available. Uh, it's a book with pictures that he took, photos that he took throughout his journey when he traveled on a ship on a boat with his family for a couple of years. And then poems that he wrote, inspired, I suppose you can say, by these pictures. And the context is the four journeys, you know, of the human being, the four journeys of our life. I will not go into the details here. I'm just reading this bit of poem. And it is from the first journey, and it is poem number 16, and it is called From Dunya to Light. And Dunya means the basic earthly state. Shifting realities, betraying its lovers, confusing mists, dark sights with rare insights. Seeking grace, tracing the sacred through sparks of passion for a way out. Darkness, fear, grief, praying for relief. Beyond confinements of dunya's veils, where there is only light, light upon light. So I had entitled this talk and it's not really only a couple of talks uh, during this retreat light upon light. And I will recite from the Quran and I will start with uh, the verse, of course, that you cannot really avoid if you want to talk about the topic of light upon light. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahmani r-Rahim. Allahu nuru al-samawati wal-ard. Mathalu nurihi ka mishkatin fiha misbah. Al-misbah fi zujajah. الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس Allahu bi kulli shay'in alim. Many, many translations of this. I will just read the one. Muhammad Asad. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. The parable of his light is, as it were, that of a niche containing a lamp. The lamp is enclosed in glass, the glass shining like a radiant star. 
a lamp lit from a blessed tree, an olive tree that is neither of the east nor of the west. The oil whereof is so bright that it would well nigh give light of itself, even though fire had not touched it. Light upon light. God guides unto his light him that wills to be guided. And to this end God propounds parables unto men, since God alone has full knowledge of all things. So Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. In reality there is only light. There is only light. Everything is light, or the essence of everything is light. The first thing becomes a bit complicated. This. The first thing that Allah created was light. But even before that, there was only light. But the first thing that Allah created was light. According to some narrations, although they are disputed, it was the prophetic light, the light of the Prophet nabiyyik. The Prophet is reported to have said, now I know there are uh, issues with the with the uh, uh, according to the muhaddithin according to the traditionists not the traditionalists although they may very well be that as well but tra traditionists the muhaddithin they have issues with this hadith basically based upon the isnad the, the, the chain of narrators of this hadith. But that may be, or be that, however it is, light is the basis of the whole of existence. The divine light The light of Allah, the light of God, I suppose you can have different ways of defining this light in a metaphysical or a scientific way, although I think all the different philosophies of metaphysics, all the different worldviews throughout the ages, trying to understand how this existence thing works, are more and more moving into some sort of one. I think scientists, people of various faiths, will somehow have to, as time moves on, come to more or less the same conclusion. And there will be a few who vehemently will deny and obstinately refuse to accept what they really know is true. But that's another matter. But it is becoming less and less space for, or less and less room for, misconceptions about how things really are. So science is moving towards that point where it can no longer deny the source of everything. As you go further and further back in history, closer and closer to the initiation of the Big Bang. 
touching the very borders of space-time. It becomes more and more untenable to ignore that thing which is beyond, or not thing, that which is beyond space and time. Even today, a larger and larger number of scientists are disturbed by being forced into the understanding that if you accept the idea of space-time as some sort of bubble or some sort of entity or you have you be or you also become forced to accepting a singularity that precedes it and this is uncomfortable to some and very comforting to some maybe so the oneness the tawhid the fact that there is only one is becoming more and more obvious you may think it is the different you may think we are getting further and further away from the truth and more and more confused but that i think in itself is a confusion i think we are really moving towards that towards towards not being able to deny that fact then if we let that inform our lives if we let that transform us if we let if it's sort of what we make of that realization that's a different matter it is not necessary that because we are forced into somehow accepting this reality it will also mean that we're all going to become angels because it doesn't we will not become angels but we can be like angels and in some way even better than angels not because we will be better than the angels or purer than the angels or or more worthy than the angels but because given our uh, I don't know. it's one of the few times I've lost for English word Förutsättningar. given our uh, what is it called? conditions Preconditions, circumstances, yeah. I realize there isn't a word, maybe. Preconditions is good because it is similar, but I, 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 okay, given our preconditions, given what we have to work with, you know, and the situation we're in, all of that, given our circumstances, given our chances, given our, uh, what we start out with, relatively, we can become better than the angels. We can rise above the material in a way. And because we are what we are, we are really the pinnacle of the creation. The whole of this amazing system this still developing world in which we find ourselves which we may choose to call space-time it's not really important you can call it dunya if you wish it's the same thing whether you adhere to the theory of big bang or not however you look upon the process of creation whatever philosophy and metaphysics you may ascribe to it is both from a historical perspective or from a physical perspective maybe you can say or, or a scientific meaning physics may, mainly maybe perspective or maybe possibly even a mathematical perspective and from a religious perspective 
we are the purpose of creation. If it wasn't for his intention, if you want to call it that, the fact that Allah had decided, Arada, we talked about Irada last night, or Imam Nusra talked about Irada, that Allah had decided to create human beings. The whole of the creation, at least as we know it, would not have come about. So from that moment, that very first moment of the Big Bang, or however you choose to look, from the Kun, let's call it the Kun, because we can agree on that. If we agree on the Quran, we can agree on the Kun. And if anyone wants to believe that the Kun is different from Big Bang, then fair enough, you can do if you want to think that it's the same, you're welcome. You can join my club if you want to. <laughs> anyway, from the moment of Kun, B, Genesis 1, you know, B, from the very first moment of creation. And really, it is only after that, or it is only relative to that, that we can even talk about before. Because beyond space and time, there is no before or after. There is no time. You know? Time is something that we experience because we are in it. We are in this bubble of space-time. You know? So, as questions is like, where was Allah, where was God before he created the world? It's kind of it's actually, it's an, it's, it's, in a way, it's a silly question. It's, it's also actually a very, in one way, a very deep question. It's a very simple question, but it doesn't, simple questions necessarily do not mean to be, do not have to be stupid. But in a way, you can say it's a wrong question. Because there is no before. Because time only comes in there. So I was, it, it was, there's no difference between before and after that. It's just beyond. There is just beyond. There is just beyond. So everything, nothing. All. You have to be careful with words. Because even thing, <laughs> and hence also everything, and body and everybody are all relating to spirit. To, 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 to dunya, to the world, to space-time. Let's call it dunya then, to be more... Let's remain in the comfort zone of, the, of, of those among us who, who are used to a Muslim terminology. So dunya. Dunya, and you know what dunya means? Dunya... No. Is, it is what the Quran calls this world. It, it's, it's the Quranic term for space-time, if you wish. But dunya actually means, or al-hayatu dunya. Actually, dunya is short for al-hayatu dunya. It's a very common practice in Arabic that you use the adjective without its noun in place of the noun. So al-hayatu dunya is usually the term al-hayat, the life. Al-dunya, yeah, the dunya life. I'm not going to reveal what dunya means yet. But instead of that, you can just say ad-dunya. And you can then mean the worldly life. Or you can mean the whole world as well. Because it's an adjective, but in Arabic it's perfectly okay to use adjectives on their own. Without the noun that they describe. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, oh, it's not strictly adjectives, but it is in a way. The Prophet ﷺ said, Bunya al-Islam wa ala khams. Islam is founded on five. Now, numbers are not strictly speaking adjectives, but they work in the same ways. They are attributes anyway. Mm -hmm. So the Prophet ﷺ said that the word Islam is founded on five. But he didn't say five what? He didn't say pillars. He didn't say principles. He didn't say foundation stones. He didn't say even things. He just said five. You can do this in Arabic. 
you can't really do this. Uh, we're not usually, we don't usually do this in English or in Swedish for that matter. But you, so in Swedish maybe a little bit more common. But anyway, in the same way dunya. But the actual meaning of the word dunya is near. Dana yadnu. Like in Surah Al-Najm. Thumma dana fatadalla fakana qaba qawseini al adna. You know, when he gets nearer and nearer, so Dana, he came nearer, he came closer. So, it's called Dunya because it is near, because it is the nearest. It is also used, Daniyun, to describe low. And you think of it usually as low as in of lesser worth, more gross, which is also true of dunya. It is, it is, it is more base, you know, right. crude, <laughs> unworthy almost, you know. It's a kind of a belittling term or, or a, it's a, sort of a negative, but the original meaning is not that. That is it. That is a conferred meaning. The original meaning is near. So the world of dunya is there because it's near. So this is near. It may be billions of light years, but it is still near. I mean, our galaxy alone is pretty large <laughs> from our perspective. And it's one of many, many, many. And it's still, it's still all within dunya. Don't think of this world, this earth, this planet, and its atmosphere, and maybe even the stratosphere as dunya. No, dunya is much, much more than that. Allah says we have adorned the heaven of dunya, the sama, the, the space. Outer space, whatever you want to call it, of dunya, with the adornment of stars. So, according to the Quran, the stars are within dunya. They are not outside of dunya. They are still within dunya. And the stars are what make up the galaxies. Even the sun is a star. Or the stars are suns, or whatever you want. So, the whole thing, even in the language of the Quran, it is part of this dunya, part of this world, part of this bubble of space-time. Even looking at it as a bubble may not be right, because how do we know what it looks like? <laughs> it's really difficult for us even to think about this. Uh, I mean, to separate, to, to think of space and time as two separate entities, that is still kind of natural for us. Although it's been over a hundred years that we've been exposed to the, the idea of space-time as a kind of continuum. But it's still very difficult for us to, to, to sort of internalize that because this idea of space and time as separate entities has been with us for so many generations. It's in our, it's in our genes in a way, it's in our DNA, it's, so, you know, it's, it's inherited kind of worldview or whatever you want to say. And that's fine. I don't think really that's an issue. I don't think it's a problem. The main thing is to realize that the dunya, this world, space-time, is not all there is. The whole of the idea of Our worldview as Muslims or as believers hinges upon this, upon the acceptance of something beyond, not something, of a world beyond space and time. I, I'm hesitating to use something because thing is limit, thing is what we find here. <laughs> Somewhere it's also difficult, you know. That's why it's called Nakuja Abad, the land of nowhere. Mm -hmm. 
the land of no place. Because places are within the dunya. And what is beyond... You can use the term place, but you have to then use, realize that you are, you are using it metaphorically. Because it's, it's, it's not part of space-time. <laughs> Just like we said, time. Because you cannot think that there was a sort of time was running and then the world was created and then time was running and then the world ended and then time is running. Because before this world there was no time. Or not in the same way that we look upon it anyway. You can say that well, there's time with a big T because there's a famous hadith Qudsi which usually is narrated as Lata Subbud Dahar Anad Dahar. But it's probably not the correct wording. But there is a, a hadith with, with hadith Qudsi meaning the Prophet says that Allah says outside of the Quran. A sacred hadith, a holy hadith, a holy narration, whatever you want to call it. Hadith Qudsi. So according to the famous version of it, which I, I'm not, maybe it also exists somewhere, but to my meaning, it's a simplified version that has been inherited, you know, through generations. Although that's not maybe the wording that the Muhaddithin would agree upon. He says, don't curse time. Allah says, the Prophet says that Allah says, don't curse time. I am time. But the wording, I think, may be more correct, is that the Prophet says that Allah says, Yu'zini ibn Adam. That the son of Adam, the human, causes me distress. Well, Allah cannot be distressed. But... An action can be an action causing distress even if the person that is exposed to the action does not actually become distressed. The action is an action of distress. So Ibn Adam distresses me. I do not get distressed by it, but he nevertheless distresses me. So Allah says, the son of Adam, human, insan, distresses me he curses time. Wa ana dahar, but I am time. Or, in spite of the fact that I am time. So when Ibn Adam curses time, this is an act of causing discomfort to God, although God does not become discomforted. That's different. God is beyond that. God is above being harmed by our efforts to harm him. But nevertheless. So in this way Allah says, I am time. Often or usually interpreted, I am the source of time. And it goes on then. I can't remember the wording in Arabic after that, but it says basically I make day pass after night, and night pass after day, I am sort of, you know, rolling out this whole system that you call time. So whether you say that Allah is time, or Allah is behind time, or Allah is the creator of time, or Allah is the initiator of time, but regardless, Allah is independent of time. Just as Allah is independent of space. That's why you cannot say where Allah is. You can not, not say Allah is here or there. Or really even, you cannot say Allah is everywhere, although Allah is everywhere. But you, cannot, you cannot limit Allah to being everywhere, if you see what I mean. You may think that everywhere is limitless, <laughs> but it's nevertheless a limitation. Because you are imposing something upon Allah of which you have no proof. And that is, it, it's discourteous, you know. So to insist on Allah being everywhere is also discourteous to what Allah. Allah is beyond where. Allah is beyond time. He is the first and the last. Before anything, before even before there is Allah. And after, even after there is Allah. 
and in the middle as well. <laughs> it's not that Allah is, is before and after but not during. No, Allah is before, after and during. <laughs> and outside of outside, beyond the beyond, most outward of all outward is Allah. Outside of every thing. <laughs> there is Allah. Wahu al batin. And inside of everything there is Allah. Within the within and without the without. And in between too. If you look at the Quran, if you look at Surah Baqarah, the very beginning, I was going to have another verse from Surah Baqarah, but I will go this one first. Right in the beginning of the Quran, before the introduction, which is the Fatiha, which is the preface to the Quran, which is the Muslim's version of the Lord Prayer, or the Quran's version of the Lord's Prayer, whatever. Before anything else in the Quran, bar the preface, the first verses of the first chapter of the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim comes with every surah of the Quran except Surah Tawbah. That's specific reasons for that. Mainly pertaining to the disagreement of the Sahaba whether Surah Tawbah actually is a separate surah or not. Not as is the famous thing because Surah Tawbah has verses uh, talking about the anger of Allah. Because, no, <laughs> Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, even in Surah Tawbah. <laughs> but because the Sahaba were not sure whether it's a separate surah or whether it's a part of the surah before it. That's why there's no Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Nevertheless, Alif Lam Mim. Again, Alif Lam Mim, we don't know the meaning. The, 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 the common tafsir of Alif Lam Mim is Allahu A'lamu bi muradih. Allah knows best what it means. It has a meaning. Don't get me wrong. Alif la mim is not pointless. It's not just some sort of, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, library, uh, you know, system kind of uh, code. <laughs> it's not just that. <laughs> you know, it is, um, has a meaning, alif la mim. It has a meaning, but it has a meaning in the same way or much in the same way that the letters themselves have meanings. But it's so subtle that we can't describe it. Even those who perchance may know the meaning can't really put it into words anyway. Common understanding among most of the scholars is that the Prophet ﷺ knew the meanings. I'm sure there are others that know the meanings but the thing is it's putting it into words is a challenge. Because it's so subtle it is so subtle that as soon as you try to define it, it disappears. It's like fog, you know, morning mist. You know, it, it, it's just as soon as you kind of touch it, it goes away. Or a, a, a bubble, a soap bubble, you know. You can't take it, you can't contain it because it goes. You can see it is there, but as soon as you try to grab it, it's gone. And the same way the meaning is so subtle that you can't really... You can't really uh, pin it down with words. But it has a meaning, Alif Lam Mim. Uh, and there, some scholars have even written, tried to give an idea of the meaning. I'm not going in there, at least not now. Thalika al kitab. Thalika means that. But we always translate it with this. Are many again uh, ways of explaining why? Why would Allah in the Quran choose the word that instead of this when He obviously means this? Hada al kitab. It should be Hada al kitab. Not Dalik al kitab. It should be Hada al kitab. Of course, this book, not that book. But one explanation is, is, is to. to, to give us an understanding of its enormity, mm. of its vastness. It is so, it is such a, 
and all encompassing such a large volume not necessarily physical size but in what it contains that you can't possibly say this <laughs> it is it is much too big to say this you have to say that that book not this book but yeah. that book the book the difference between the book and the book so this is the book not the book this is the book la rebafi no doubt either you can say there is no doubt that there is that this is the book or in this book there is no doubt or no doubt this is the book or this is the book wherein there is no doubt all of the translations are absolutely correct the arabic can handle all of those meanings perfectly and probably a few more as well without i mean they are all correct translations you don't have to you don't even have to be uh, you know, uh, what shall I say? The, you don't have to labor them. Mm. You know, they're all these four things I suggested are all natural translations of these words, perfectly, adequately, matching perfectly the Arabic language without having to stretch it or assume anything or anything like that. It's all perfect. So it contains all of those meanings together at the same time, effortlessly. It is a guidance to the people of taqwa, to the people of awareness, to the people who care, to the people who have reverence. Taqwa means so many things. Careful people. Or in it, there is guidance to people who okay, care. Again, <laughs> the wordings, you know, this fihi, la reba fihi, there is no doubt in it, or there is no doubt in it is a guidance for those who care, or it is a guidance for those who care, or those who are aware, or those who have um, courtesy, or those who, who, who are um, wary, or those who tread warily, or however you want to say, taqwa. So many explanations. Uh, in a wonderful uh, narration in an author, I think it is Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he says, and this is so, I like this, this, this story or this narration because he doesn't say that I or someone doesn't say that oh, Umar said this. This is what taqwa means. But he's, Umar is saying that I asked somebody else or somebody asked me. And I don't even know if that somebody even is mentioned. So what Omar says is that someone has asked me to explain taqwa. Or what is taqwa? Or I asked somebody what is taqwa. Or Omar asked somebody what is taqwa and this person said that how do you walk through some thorny bushes, a place where there are a lot of thorns. How do you walk through them? So he said, I would walk very carefully, wrapping my clothes around me so I don't get caught up on any of the thorns. He said, that's taqwa. You with me? We translate taqwa as fear, but it's not really correct. There are many other words in Arabic for fear. Taqwa is not one of them. Taqwa means to be careful, to take care, you know. Just as you carefully would walk through those, you don't really fear the bushes. You may fear getting caught up in the bushes, mm -hmm. but you don't fear the bushes. Otherwise, you wouldn't go in there at all. Mm -hmm. You go there, but you go with care. You tread warily, with respect, making sure that you guard yourself so you don't get caught up unnecessarily and rip your clothes on those bushes, on the thorns of the bushes. You just walk through there. And it's the same thing with taqwa. So it is a guidance for people who care, who people who are careful, who people who have courtesy, who people who have awareness, who people who know, or at least try to know, or at least bother about how they conduct themselves. Who are they? Alladina yu'minuna bil
What is the definition of the muttaqin? Or what is the definition of those muttaqin, those careful people, those people of awareness, those people of courtesy, for whom the Quran is a guidance? Or for whom there is a guidance in the Quran? Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. Those who have faith in the unseen. Those who find comfort in the realization that there is something beyond that which you can see. That there is something beyond space and time. The acceptance of an existence beyond space and time is really the very first step to belief. Or faith, I should say. You can believe lots of stuff. We all believe lots of things. Even though those, even atheists believe, they just believe in something else. You know, or, I mean, so belief is no. Yes, we have beliefs. We have aqaid, you know, beliefs. But it's not a good translation of iman. Amana yumino doesn't mean beliefs, does it? Ya'taqidu means beliefs. Amana yumino, it comes from aman. Aman means security. security. It means this Swedish word trighet, you know. It means comfort. It means, you know, asylum is aman. Al mustamin, someone who seeks asylum, someone who seeks comfort, someone who wants to be safe, someone who wants to be secure. So to be secure, to feel safe and secure, to rest firmly, securely, calmly in the realization that this is not all there is, but there is something beyond. That is Iman. So this light that manifests through this prism of space and time, this uh, this light of oneness, this light of Tawheed, this divine light, this by means or by way of a parable, this white beam when it hits the prism of space and time or the prism of creation, Big Bang, it diversifies into all the different colors. You know, you, you know a light beam. You must have seen this picture. A light beam hits a prism. You know a prism, triangular piece of glass, for example. And the light beam hits it, and on the other side you see all these colors of the rainbow coming out in a, like in a feather sort of shape, or you know, in a conical shape, like this. It's obviously a simplified. Little. You can see it when you see the rainbow. That's what you see. You see the, the sort of, to us at least, fairly um, cohesive single colored whitish yellow light of the sun hits the cloud of raindrops or the sort of the, the mass of raindrops and it diversifies into the spectrum that we see in the rainbow. So the rainbow also is a kind of a prism. So in the much the same way but in a way, when we do things, when we explain things by example, we always have to remember that the example is not the real thing. So when I compare the divine light of Allah with the light of the sun, it's not the same. Yes, it is light. Yes, it, we are talking about, but it's like the qualities of Allah. It's like the attributes of Allah, the divine attributes. They are represented within us, but not the same. We see, 
But our seeing and Allah seeing, it is no, there's, you know. <laughs> you can't really begin to compare them, but we can still somehow, the only thing they share really is the name. And the same thing you can say at the light of the sun. So understand the, 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 the parable, the, the, uh, the sort of uh, similitude, the wonderful translation of the Quran by Marmaduke Pickthall, you know. God strike is a similitude. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's a similitude. <laughs> like he's trying to show something by example of something else. He's trying to explain or put words to that which cannot be contained by words. By using words to describe a, an analogous phenomenon within this framework of space-time. Trying to explain something which is beyond space-time by giving an example from space-time that is analogous, but not the same. So the divine light contains everything, all there is, but it only becomes manifest when it hits form. And that's when it diversifies into the different, analogous to the different colors after the prism, <laughs> to the spectrum, the spectrum of reality, if you wish. So reality is one. Reality is one. Reality is complete gatheredness, complete unity, indivisible, Uh, you know, singular, I don't know really what words to use to describe the indescribable, but it, it is not even conceivable that you could divide it up into different anything. It's one. Allahu Ahad, Allah is one. Allahu Wahid, Allah is one. Allah is one in every single way. Allah is Just like you cannot conceive of any number, you know, any multi multiple when it comes to Allah, you can also not conceive of any, uh, what do you call the opposite of multiples? <laughs> Division, what do you call it? Fraction. Mm. Fraction, yeah. There's no multiple, there's no fraction. There's just one, not half. You cannot have half or a thousandth or, you know, eight, no. So the divine light is one, but the manifestation, the manifestation is multiple, multitude, the spectrum. Just like the, one, the, the, the light in the example is one, but when it hits the prism, it's many. So it's all about light. Everything is light. Everything is light. And as I said, science is <coughs> kind of getting there as well. <laughs> that everything is light. But when it's become diffracted or sort of, you know, Multiplied, or however you want to say it, it's not really multiplied, it's diffracted through the prism of the world. Then you get all this duality or multiplicity that we have in this world. And that's when you get also this, which is not really the opposite to light, but in a way you could think of it as an opposite to light. It is actually the absence of light, which is darkness. That's why the term shadow is much better. Because that's what it is, you know, shadow. I mean, the shadow is, you can only have a shadow if you have light to start with. You know? yeah. <laughs> shadow is actually an, 
an effect of light. It's an effect of the veiling from the light. Isn't it? I mean, I'm sure you can see some shadows now. I've got this strong lights yeah. on me. So there will be some shadows, no doubt. Hopefully uh, they will not be uh, disturbing. But there will be shadows. But if you turn the lights off, there won't be any shadows. Will there? No. So shadow is an effect of the light. And that's where we come to these shadows and darkness from this verse of the Quran. I'm just trying to... Also in Surah Nur, as there was an explanation of light, there is an explanation of darkness. There are several different ideas about the sort of confusion of this world as a, as a mirage that you see in the desert, a person traveling in the desert, and of course the primary addressees of the Qur'an, the contemporaries of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they were used to life in the desert, so examples from the desert are perfect for them. They know every grain of sand in the desert. They know everything there is to know about the desert. So those who deny, those who refuse to see, those who cover up the truth, their deeds, their actions are like a mirage in, a, in, 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 a, in the desert. Or in, well, that's called in the desert. That the thirsty person assumes to be water. Until when he comes to it, he finds there's nothing. He thought there were water there, but there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. <laughs> so just like the action, you th they thought they did actions, they thought they did deeds, but actually when it comes to it, it they didn't do anything. All the things we are gathering, everything we're doing in this world, all the wealth we're gathering, all the, you know, what we are spending so much of our lives with, build up this sort of material wealth. When it comes to it, it's nothing. Unless it is used for a good purpose, unless it is used to develop something lasting, something valuable. But in itself, it is nothing. It's of no worth. And he founds Allah there. He comes to the mirage, finds there is no water there, but there is Allah. He finds Allah there. It's also a metaphor for the hereafter. You come there, you think you've got all these deeds. You find you didn't have anything. But you still have to meet Allah. So he takes his account in full. You come there, you think you're coming with a big sack of stuff. I've got all these things. I'm coming now, you know, I've got all oh, so much. I'm going to, wow, I'm going to get full marks. You know. And you get there, and all the things you thought you had, you didn't have anything. But you still have to take, give account. Only there was nothing there. What you thought was there was just nothing, was just numbers. It's gone. Or it's like you had your electronic bank balance and when you come there to, to, to give reckoning it's just it's cleared. Someone pushed a reset button, nothing there. Or you come with all those notes and you see they're all pieces of paper. There's just nothing there. Wallahu sariul hisab and Allah is quick of reckoning. You know, it doesn't take time. It can happen at any time. It can happen at death, of course. It can happen on the day of judgment, of course. It happens now as well. It happens all the time. That's the verse preceding the one I actually wanted to say. Or, now another analogy, because the Quran is full of parables. It's absolutely chock-a-block of parables. Most of the Quran is parables. Because the Quran is an attempt, actually a successful attempt, because Allah would not do anything unsuccessful. 
the Quran is explaining things which cannot be explained. It's describing things, things, phenomena, that which cannot be described <laughs> by examples from that which we can understand. Is the whole that's, the whole, that's basically the whole idea of the Quran. All the time, it's, it's telling us the truth, it's showing us the way, it's describing to us wonders that we cannot even begin to imagine. And to do that, it uses a language full of metaphors, full of parables, full of examples from the world around us that we can relate to so that we will have a chance of getting an idea of the things which are being described. So it's as darkness is in a deep sea covered by a wave above which there is another wave above which there is a cloud so you're in the dead, in the dark waters, under waves, under waves, and on top of that there's clouds as well. This is how it is. The light is there, but we don't see it because it's veiled by these waves. Now, this, the, the, basically, the, the, the light is there <laughs> of the sun. It's day, it's not night. But you're in, under the water, under several layers of waves, and on top of the waves there are even layers of clouds. How can you see anything? You know, it is darkness is one of them above the other. It's coverings. إِذَا أَخْرَجَ يَدَهُ لَمْ when it takes, when when you take your hand out, you can't see it. The, the hand is so near; it's only like you know. You can't see it. You have vision; you're not blind. Twenty twenty vision. You can't see the hand. You can't see your fingers in front of you, because the light which is there is covered by clouds, by waves, by shadows. Or, you know, layers of darkness. So for, for whomsoever Allah does not make nur, there is no nur. The nur is there, of course there is nur, but it is not for us unless Allah makes it for us. The nur is there. But for the Noor to be for us, for us to be recipients of that Noor, of the divine illumination, of the, of, of the, of the divine um, light, we have to make ourselves receptive. So we have to become owners of that Noor. So how to own that nur so we can have light upon light and light upon light I was really going to you know <laughs> say what I meant with that this time but time is up so I will have to leave that till my next session. <laughs>